Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Palo Alto, California at the Four Seasons Hotel, an interesting event. It's called Security in the Boardroom. And it's part of the security series put on by the Chertoff Group. They do a couple events a year and they've returned to the Four Seasons. And, and it's really an interesting twist on the whole security discussion, really elevating it to what's happening in the boardroom. We're excited to be here and we've got some great guests lined up. And we've got our first guest of the day, he's Bob Griffin. He's the CEO of IOSD. Correct. Welcome, Bob. Thanks. I got the pronunciation right. So you, you did indeed. For people that aren't familiar with the company, what is IOSD all about? Well, IOSD is an artificial intelligence platform manufacturer that builds technologies that allows us to effectively deploy enterprise class artificial intelligence applications. For security specific applications? Security applications. Beyond security. Yeah, beyond security, but okay. security is, we're fundamentally focused in three areas. We're focused in the f financial crimes area, specifically around doing things like anti money laundering, risk, and compliance. Um, waste, fraud, and abuse. Okay. We're focused a lot in the healthcare area around doing things like you know, clinical variation management, population health risk. And we've got a very strong focus in the federal government and the public sector, mostly around the intelligence community, DOD, and so forth. Okay, so, so uh, financial institutions, the government, and then who's the purchaser? What's this kind of the segment that buys kind of your healthcare focused uh, applications? It's traditionally both the payers and the providers. Okay. So folks that are looking at, uh, you know, how do we manage costs associated, but how do we make more effective the use of healthcare practices? Right. So, um, you know, folks like uh, Mercy Hospital, folks like um, like um, uh, Intermountain, uh, United Healthcare, right. folks like that. that uh, so it's interesting, there's a lot of talk, right, of machine learning and AI right now. It's hot, 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 like big data was a couple of years ago, but I think it's a lot of people are still confused as to how is it actually being used? Is it actually being used? You know, it's probably affecting them in ways that they have no idea. So you know, how is the adoption of AI kind of progressing from your point of view in these industries and how is it helping transform them? Well, it's, abso it's absolutely transformational technology. Um, the reality is all applications eventually are going to have to become intelligent or they become obsolete. Um, the biggest challenge with, um, with artificial intelligence um, is that it's, it's moving incredibly quickly. Um, the rate of change uh, milestones are daily. So if you're not running to artificial intelligence applications or developing and deploying those, you're behind the curve. If you're sitting at the stoplight right now and your competitors are entering the intersection using artificial intelligence, you're never going to catch up. So you have to move quickly. Right. Um, the second thing uh, I think is that, that artificial intelligence now has, has got an opportunity that can really focus and help with real business problems. You know, traditionally what we've done with artificial intelligence is we've parked it in innovation labs or we've parked it in R&D. It's time to take it out of that and really put it to place in areas around opportunities. We talked earlier about anti-money laundering. Right. right. How do you reduce the number of false positives to make your 5,000 investigators more effectively? Artificial intelligence can do that kind of ap application. So are, I wonder if there's any stories you can share publicly about you know, some of the big impacts or maybe little impacts that people would never have guessed where you can apply this type of technology to a positive outcome. Sure. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, let's take anti-money laundering as an example. We have a client that has nearly 7,000 investigators, and their challenge is they are getting almost 98% false positives. They came 98 to 98 percent 98 false, false positives. positives. I mean, think about that. Which is crazy. Yeah, out of every hundred, you know, only two, um, uh, you know, uh, positives are actually effective, All right? So, so they came to us and said, um, "Look, if we can reduce our false positives by say three to five percent, that's a home run for us, right? Uh, what, what do you think you can do to help us?" Um, we took their information, their data, put ourselves within their workflow. Um, and we were able to give them a 26% reduction in false positives. Well, that changes the game for them. That, right. the, the, just the economic savings alone is incredible. You know, you're talking nearly $140 million. So, um, uh, you know, those are real things. Um, I'll give you one more example uh, in the healthcare area. Um, we've been studying um, type 2 diabetes for nearly 40 years, right? Uh, we took that same data set that people have been studying and working with one of our partners. Uh, we were able to very quickly, through our platform, segment up that data set and show that type 2 diabetes really falls into three sub-segments. And those sub-segments are really uh, indicators of what's likely to happen to patients. But more importantly, uh, you know, they sub-segment up into things like um, uh, these clients or these patients that have this conditions are likely to develop cancer. These clients are likely to develop you know, retinopathy, blindness. Um, what that's doing is it's changing the way not only they're going to prosecute a cure, but also the way they're going to prosecute um, the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Right. It's, it's changing the game. 
So it's interesting. So you've got a technology platform. Do you also deliver the data scientists? I mean, how does it work in terms of, you know, are, are you a tool that you hand to data scientists inside the organization, yeah. the one you just, you just uh, gave an example of and gives them a, a different tool? Are you also delivering services to help refine and, and tune? Because cause obviously it's always implied that these things, sure. not only do you pump the data in, but there's a continuing ongoing process of learning as they you know, yeah, continue absolutely. to get smarter. Yeah. The, the answer actually is yes. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we provide a platform and that platform um, really comes with capabilities to enable our clients to develop artificial intelligence applications in real time or near real time. So, you know, uh, it has things like, um, you know, an SDK, it has REST APIs, but more importantly, it has a tool we developed called Envision. And that Envision really allows our clients to very rapidly prototype uh, up new artificial intelligence applications and get them into production incredibly quickly. Now, to your point, there are some of our clients that don't have um, the technological skills or prowess that, but yet are, need to take advantage of the technology. So we have, a, we have a professional services capability that will come in, we'll bring in data scientists as required, we'll bring in subject matter experts as needed, um, we'll bring in program managers and so forth, and we'll take them from kind of cradle to grave in helping them build out those applications. As part of that, we'll train them, educate them, and let them to become self-sufficient. Because one of the things that I think is incredibly important about artificial intelligence that nobody's talking about is any machine intelligent application has to be able to do five things. It has to be able to discover, you know, find out and do observational discovery. Uh, what does it not know about itself? What, what can it learn? Um, and that's important because if you can do, for example, unsupervised discovery, then you can do the next thing, prediction, much more effectively. So it has to be able to do discovery. It has to be able to do prediction. From the past, we can predict the future. Right? It has to be able to do justification, and that's probably one of the most important areas uh, that we talk about. Justification is not necessarily what is it the algorithm did, it, but why did it do that? Why, why did it take that action? Why did it segment the population to these sizes? What is it that it proved? Why did that sensor go off and so forth? So this is really to kind of re unveil the black box a little bit. Absolutely, it's a complete wants white box anymore, solution, right? absolutely. Okay. And then lastly, it's got to be able to do two additional things. It's got to be able to act right. on what, it's, what it has discovered, what it's predicted, what it's justified. And then lastly, it's got to be episodic. It's got to learn. Right. So what did I learn from the last episode and how do I apply that back to a new form of discovery, a new form of prediction, the next level of justification um, and action. That's a great summary, Bob. Um, and it's interesting, because um, you guys talk a lot about doing some homework before I came in on the justification piece. You know, mm -hmm. the, you got to open up that black box. It's no mm -hmm. longer good enough just to kick out an answer. Absolutely. Um, and if you can't act on it, what's the point? You know, exactly, kinda, exactly. You know, that it's more of a science experiment. I want to, before I let you go, run out of time, but uh, kind of the roots of the company, um, is, is around this thing called topological data analysis. Mm -hmm. And you're not a data scientist, nor am I, but kind of conceptually, what, what was different about that approach um, that people weren't doing uh, previously? Well, so topological data science is uh, data analysis is the study of um, the shape of data. Um, all data comes in shape. Um, the challenge historically is most people apply traditional algorithms to data, assuming that it's going to be in a linear fashion, for example. So they'll apply linear regression analysis. Or if it's clustered data, they'll apply clustering technologies and so forth. Um, the challenge is, what happens if your data is in a flare shape? Or what if it's in a circular shape? Or what if it's uh, time series based and so forth? What we do is with TDA is the first thing it does is we, we understand the shape of the data because the data will tell you a lot about itself and its shape, and from that shape you can start to ask more intelligent questions about the data so you can unlock all of the insight. So it's really almost like a higher order kind of organization, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, to add, because of course we always look for patterns, right? That's, that's, that's what we always do exactly. as people. Exactly. All right, well Bob, really interesting conversation. I look Thanks. forward to the next time we get a chance to sit down. Unfortunately, we, uh, we'll have to leave it there for now. All right, appreciate your time. All Thanks. right, Bob Griffins, he's the CEO at IOSD. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We're at the Chertoff event. It's called Security in the Boardroom. We'll be right back after this next break. Thanks for watching.